Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Saki, and we are still at the American Anthropological Association's annual meeting. And I am super excited now to be sitting down with Dr. Diego Vigil. Thank you for joining us on the show. My pleasure. Thank you, really appreciate it. I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, let's give a background on Diego. Urban anthropologist focused on Mexican Americas, Professor Emeritus of Social Ecology at UC Irvine, PhD in Anthropology from UCLA, and various teaching and administrative positions. Focused on ethnohistory, education, cultural change, acculturation, and adolescent and youth issues, especially street gangs. And he's a six-time author, everything from Street Smart, School Smart, to From Indians to Chicanos, to Gang Redux, to a rainbow of gangs, personas mexicanas, and barrio gangs. So I'm really excited to talk to you because it's like you've been analyzing something that is very pressing that society needs to learn about, which is the way that we uh, we behave and, and engage with uh, with culture of youth that is that kind of splits. When I was learning about you, you have analyzed the way that um, that humans split due to social and economic pressures into either gangs or normal life. Yes, that's correct, yeah. I have a theoretical framework that I utilize to explain all the varying facets of this split. Uh, it's called multiple marginality because I don't just focus on one factor, one force. I talk about the cumulative, additive nature of all the different forces that affect youth and turn them to the streets and then as part of that uh, street socialization, they develop a street identity. Unfortunately, that uh, one of the dominant street forces now are gangs. And what are the most prevalent social pressures that guide youth into gangs? And yeah, let's go with that. Well, again, the additive nature. Yeah. First of all, uh, they may be a different ethnic group and racially distanced from the major population. That's how you get segregation of people in different neighborhoods. That's one force, and that's an important one. And then within their families, they may be struggling economically, not able to uh, totally support their children and all the different uh, needs that they have. That's another force. And then within the family, uh, if the economic pressures and the discrimination take their toll, you might not have a very, uh, intact family. It may not be organized according to the middle class families that have a decent living that are more or less accepted in society. So you wind up with kids uh, that are, the parents lack parent skills or are absent in terms of parenting. Uh, so that's another factor. And then the other factor, again, when uh, schools are not able to handle uh, these students that have not been raised with all the resources they need and the guidance they lack from parents and other adu adults, they uh, begin to associate and, and hang around with other equally uh, sort of uh, yeah. uneducated and sort of ignored students. Yeah. And by hanging around with them, they get solace and support, but they also learn more about habits. And then eventually, the school uh, is strained Families are unable to really guide their children, those two forces along with the neighborhood and the racism and segregation experience. And then you wind up with kids interacting with uh, law enforcement in a very negative way. Uh, one that uh, law enforcement feels they have to sort of show them early who's in charge and this is the way you behave and you guys are behaving inappropriately. But again, all those different factors and all those different pressures, all those different gaps and voids create the need for an identity. And since they grow up in the streets more uh, regularly than they do at school and, 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 and with law enforcement, then they, they develop a street identity and personality pursuing their street oriented, and that's it. And from there, uh, who do they deal with? Who are their peers? Other similarly disaffected children. Yes. You know, they're young teenagers, maybe older teenagers. And sometimes you have a group of them, a kind of a, a young adult uh, peer group. Yeah. They're not the same age as 12, 13, 14 year olds that are just getting into the street life. 
but they've been around 19, 20 years old. They've been around a while, a lot more hardened, and then they sort of become the street uh, counselors to these youth. Oh man, so the variety of pressures from inside their family all the way to once they are actually there, they have uh, the, 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 it's almost a benefit of having a click of people of, 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 of almost love. It's a That's the word they use, uh, they love and they take care of their homeboys and they watch their back and sometimes the only person these kids on the streets count on are similarly street socialized children. And that's how they form groups and then the groups could become more lethal and become gangs. Take for example in Central America, uh, for the longest time, most of the 20th century, you always had street children in uh, Honduras and Nicaragua and Guatemala. They were poor, they hung around together, but they didn't form gangs as we know them here in Los Angeles or the United States. But once we started deporting street gang members to Central America, this is after the King riots of 1992. Mm -hmm. Immigration authorities and police had this bright idea mm -hmm. that they're gonna solve the gang problem here. Mm -hmm. It's a hot potato. Mm -hmm. So they rounded up all the youngsters that were in gangs that didn't have their papers. They weren't no. citizens. They deported them to those countries. And they Are we hung around. Thousands of people? Yeah, yeah, hundreds for sure. Yeah. And perhaps even thousands. Uh, and they went to their home country that they had never known because they came here as infants and young mm. children. They've been America, Americans more than they've been Guatemalans. Yeah. So they, they go back to these countries, Guatemala, Central America countries. MS 13 started like that. They sent them back there and they socialized the kids that are street children, but not gang, into what you should be, should be organized into, into the Marasava Trucha 13 or uh, 18th Street or some of the other gangs that are the, the, these uh, deported children are, are, are from here in Los Angeles. So that's a good way of teaching gang culture to kids that are street and poor oriented but not gangs as we know. And that's how, that's how we had MS-13 grow to be such a powerful and uh, instrumental street group in the Western Hemisphere, not just Los Angeles or Pico Union area. Mm -hmm. That's one example of when you, you, when you use a policy that's misguided and not really thoughtful, not obviously not based on social science. And they, and they send them there thinking that's gonna solve the problem here. The hot potato, has been set someplace else. Yeah. Wow. And then what about the the solutions to the hot potato that you've been understanding? You you went and you looked at uh, gang injunc injunctions. Right. Yeah, teach us about that. Well, the gang injunction along with the STEP Act, street terrorism enforcement policy. Mm. Uh, these two laws were put into place in the late 1980s when gang problems were at the highest level. Uh, and gang injunction in particular was aimed at a neighborhood that had a very violent and uh, problematic gang that was a nuisance to the rest of the neighborhood and the community. As the so, neighborhood was being gentrified? Well, that came later. Okay. Uh, these neighborhoods then were, ice, were identified as gang problem neighborhoods. So the law enforcement, police, and district attorney had this law, the gang injunction, mm -hmm. that they came and named different gang members and they said they couldn't hang around with each other, they couldn't dress a certain way, a lot of different uh, infringements on the civil rights. This is a way of combating gangs. But what happened is that they didn't just identify the violent, most problematic gangs. They identified areas that were being gentrified. And mm. they, for instance, the example And the police case, would patrol those areas. Well, they would patrol them and then they'd had a gang injunction would make, make it easier to keep watch over these guys because mm -hmm. they had their name and they mm. told them wh who they could hang around with, how they could dress and where they could be. I mean, just, and plus if they, the step back was uh, a law that if they committed an infraction, they were thrown in jail for a longer period of time and given a heavier uh, penalty 
for those that law. The gang injunction in the case that I was an expert witness was in Orange Vadio, Cyprus, in Orange County, right next to Chapman University. Chapman was growing as a university. They needed land, and right next door was an old neighborhood that had once been the migrant workers of the 1920s. In fact, their neighborhood's right across the street from the packing plants that are still there, you know, uh, wooden uh, buildings from the 1920s. And so Chapman needed that uh, land for their expansion. They got a hold of law enforcement, they got a hold of the district city. We need that land. So urban renewal, get rid of Mexicans, or in this case, the gang injunction, let's get rid of this gang. And the gang wasn't even that lethal. It didn't even have that many infractions. But we went to court and we proved to the judge that the district attorney named too many gang members that weren't gang members, just kids that were in the neighborhood. And they were cousins or friends of one of the gang members. So they had it such a, a large net and they, picked, they identified so many kids. So in court, we proved to the judge that this was not correct, mm -hmm. not a way to go about cleaning up a gang problem in the neighborhood. And the judge agreed with us, and the jury agreed with whatever mm -hmm. case we, we presented, and they got rid of it. And that case was taken to a, a higher authority court, and, uh, and uh, they agreed with the, the earlier judge that it was, not, it was unconstitutional to do that. Now, law enforcement, on that, on that law enforcement has pulled back from that law. LA, I was also part of a case. Because that was and, a big net, right? These right. Were saying well, it's just, you huge pick huge up net. anybody. Yeah. Any kid in the neighborhood is automatically uh, labeled a gang member. When in fact, uh, you know, they, and then plus the fact that they identified it as a very violent gang in the neighborhood, and it was a nuisance to the other residents there. Mm -hmm. When in fact, there were all kinds of neighborhoods that were worse in violence and more of a nuisance. And those were ignored because they were not part of gentrification. So that's a way of cleaning up and using a law poorly. Mm -hmm. And that now they can't use the law. They're eliminating the use of that policy as a solution to gangs. Fortunately, since the late 1990s, there's been an effort to do something other than punishment. Because mm -hmm. there's three things you can do with gangs. You could prevent them from joining. You could uh, suppress them. That's where you have law enforcement. Yeah. Or you could intervene. So prevention and intervention is a lot cheaper and a lot better and a lot earlier. So then school suppression. Then yeah. suppression. That's totally. when you have gang injunctions. Yeah. That's not. Uh, that totally. has not worked. And in, in fact, the motive for using it is not even what it was intended for. It was something else. So the ACLU that I worked closely with were successful of getting these things uh, cut back and on the verge of being eliminated. And it seems as though the, um, the, the education, the prevention step in the very youth is the best. Well, of course. Yeah. The younger, the better. Head Start. And tell Every us, year, Head Start has difficulty getting fully funded. Head Start. That would, be, us, that would be one prevention uh, effort that would save us a lot of money. Yes. A lot of headaches. Get these kids young, begin to teach them how to be a good student, yeah. how to read. My wife's a board member in the school, uh, Whittier School District, and her main objective is get to kids to read by third grade. And if you get them to do that, that opens all kinds of vistas for them. It helps direct them in a more conventional, pro-social way. And the schools make efforts to have programs to integrate students that come from uh, economically different backgrounds and uh, also been treated with racist uh, barriers and, and other kinds of uh, uh, poor methods of uh, inter integrating them into society. And then also out of, out of your other books that you've authored, um, what have been some of the big highlights for you that you would want to share? Well, there's a, my first book is my favorite. I'm working on it right now with a- Barrio Gangs. No, I'm talking about earlier. What's earlier than that? From Indians to Chicanos. Oh, It's okay. a history of 500 years, going back to the pre-Columbian Aztec time to the present mm. Chicano movement time. Mm -hmm. 
uh, in the 500 years of contact, conflict, and change, and developments where you have the submergence of a population and the emergence of a superior elite population, uh, we're trying to make it a, a, a mixed reality game, like a virtual reality mm -hmm, game. Mm -hmm. And I'm very excited about that because there's a lot of action, a lot of wars, a lot of upheavals, and a lot of uh, disagreements over race and culture and religion that could be the source of the conflict. And that's kids learning about having a good time shooting them up, but why and how and where some of the information that's more academically based it would be of use for kids to get that information. And who was being submerged and who was being... We're talking about the Indians of the Western Hemisphere. Yeah, yeah. And the Africans that were brought in against their wishes and better judgment yeah, as yeah. slaves. So the, the population that was here and the population that was brought in. And what happened to these two populations? And I, we have uh, in the storyline we're developing, we have about 10 tribes, including some of the maroon black uh, groups that started like the Seminoles. The Seminoles were a black Indian group that merged together. Mm -hmm. And there are all other spots in Veracruz, uh, Eastern Mexico and in Acapulco in Western Mexico, mm -hmm. where there was a large African population that merged with the population, the uh, Indian population. So we're talking about natives of the Western Hemisphere. Natives of the Western Hemisphere for 500 years have been, 500 years. Sub, have been sub, 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 submerged, submerged. submergence under the, the Spanish of, yeah. and then the Anglo-American. Yeah, Spanish and then Anglo-American. Well, actually, wow. let's be fair about it. Yeah. The Spanish, the Mexicans, the Anglo, wow. and now, uh, well, we get every day news uh, headlines about the caravan and about immigration yeah, yeah. and about uh, how we have a lot of criminals and rapists, rapists here from the immigrant population that's helped us build up the industries totally. that helped in the wars. I have totally. uncles that were in World War I. I had a brother in World War II yeah. joined the day after Pearl Harbor. We're very proud of our achievements in being good Americans, yeah. but you, we just want to be treated fairly yes. and yes. equitably. Yes, yes. <sighs> so for many of the Chicanos, is my favorite book right now, even though I've written the gang books that are very good and useful, and I'm very proud of those books mm -hmm. too. And uh, mostly growing up in downtown Los Angeles, on the streets myself, I learned what that life is all about. Never really got into serious trouble. Through sports, I was able to go to college, and then from there I started getting turned on to different academic subjects. So, Diego, two, two quick points here that I want to uh, ask you about. Well, first one is, what have been some of your favorite moments from teaching kids? Well, the favorite moment is when kids, you can see the, the light bulb turn on yeah. for the ideas that I might be sharing. Yeah. Uh, giving them insight, like for instance, one of the facts that it's surprising to so many students, including a lot of Chicano, Mexican-American students. There was a war between the United States and Mexico in 1846 and 48. Mm -hmm. It's called the Mexican-American mm -hmm. War. The United States took over one third of Mexican territory. Mm -hmm. All those states mm -hmm. that have funny names, yeah. California, New Mexico, Arizona, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, Arizona, Texas, Utah, yeah. Nevada, are Indian tribes or Spanish uh, named for the state based on historical circumstances. So they, those Los states... Los Angeles, San Diego, yeah, all, San everything. Francisco. San Jose, yeah. we're San Jose, San Jose right, right now. now yeah. All those names tell us that people were here before. Yeah. And people that were uh, decent folks, families were important, and uh, the, there was efforts to keep peace and quiet and all that stuff. But uh, with the war, the United States wrote a treaty with Mexico, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And in the treaty, they uh, were gonna preserve the ownership of land. The natives had land that they owned. Okay, they were gonna preserve the culture and their language, and that was ignored, just completely uh, bowled, pulled over. Uh, so that's 
when I locked lecture about the Mexican War, students look at me like, like dumbfounded. Yeah. Wow, there's a war? You know, yeah. we, weren't, we didn't immigrate here? Well, the line that people use, the, we didn't cross the border. The border crossed us. <laughs> Damn. I That's have family that was born border. in New Mexico before the war. Yeah. My grandfather was born in 1842 in New Mexico. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so anyway, That's and I'm real proud good. of being an American. And in fact, Mexicans co uh, collaborated with the United States in, in helping to take it over uh, the Southwest. You study some of the yeah. events. The yeah. Alamo had all kinds of Mexicans, yeah. and it was just uh, Anglos. So it's not that we were like trying to uh, kowtow to the dominant racial group that was seeping over the nation or the territory. It's like there's, there's certain political and social principles the United States abides by. And we like those principles. We just want them applied equally and regularly over a period of time. Yes, exactly. I can't believe it that you just said that the border didn't, you didn't cross the border, the border was put Rust there. Us, yeah. yeah, it was pushed there and crossed you. Said, and, pl and plus, right after the war, Mexican labor was needed. Millions of Mexicans came to work, the yeah. farms, the cattle ranches, the mines. They built up the Southwest. They were contributors, major yes, contributors. Yes. And now and still are. Still, they still, still are. are. Major and contributors. All, and then the war comes, totally. we're ready to go. We're first in totally. line. It just, it just need, we just need a little respect. I've had many light bulbs go off while we've been talking, and so I am happy that you picked that as something that you love with teaching. Now, last thought. What are your thoughts about the current state of humanity and where we're heading? I'm very disappointed. The older I get, the more disappointed. Uh, for instance, uh, the other day we celebrated the 100 year anniversary of World War One. That was a major conflict. Yes. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people died. I'm thinking of the Battle of Argonne. My two uncles uh, were the Ar in the Argonne, mm -hmm. in that forest area. Uh, and our president didn't even go to the ceremonies. Other people aren't even, are completely oblivious to that major conflict that should be taught in schools. The importance of that kind of ethnic uh, cleansing, you know, so many people yes. killed. Let's learn from those lessons. Yes. And then we repeat the uh, war, World War II, and then we have all these smaller versions of the uh, wars. And I'm disappointed that, uh, well, the United Nations gave, was given a little bit of power at the beginning and then more and more people just ignored that and don't understand that the world is too small now. It's gotta be made peaceful. Yes. We gotta get rid yes. of this, this religious and economic and other conflicts in yes. order to have more peace and tranquility and raise our children in a easy kind of way where they can enjoy life and get into art Yes. Get into intellectual pursuits, yes. scientific pursuits, and that is what you know. We have. A, we're in Afghanistan. We're in Iraq. We're in, uh, rattling swords with North Korea. Mm -hmm. You know, it just that like, goes on and on and on. And, and unfortunately, the population seems to enjoy the fact that we are the big cheeses and the kick and the man. You know what I mean? That's that's not conducive to making a peaceful, quiet, and just uh, internally development, or when we get externally involved, help other people develop, you know, along the same lines that we want to expand on. Peace, quality for our children and our, our future. We need to learn from the past mistakes that have been made throughout civilization right. and have a greater harmony, a greater stewardship and pass that to children right. and have us thrive as a planet. Right. Diego, I'm. I've, said, I've had so many light bulbs go off, and I really appreciate you sitting down with us. And I thank you for thank, inviting me. Thank you, thank you for joining us. I'm on glad the we show. met last night. Me too, Diego. Me too. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Give us your thoughts in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. Also, check out Diego's links below, and check out AAA's links as well, please. And go and build the future. Go and manifest your destiny into the world, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Much love. Peace.